Good morning, everybody, and welcome to season three of SageMaker Fridays. My name is Julian, and I'm a principal developer advocate focusing on AI and machine learning. Before we explain what SageMaker Fridays are about, please meet my co-presenter. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Segolen, and I'm a senior data scientist working with the AWS Machine Learning Solution Lab. Uh, my role is to help uh, customers get their ML projects on the right track in order to create business value as fast as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you again for, uh, for being with us, and uh, we'll definitely need your expertise. So this new season of SageMaker Fridays will uh, continue with the hands-on approach that I think we all enjoyed in season two. So twice a month, we'll focus on real-life machine learning use cases, and we'll solve them using Amazon SageMaker and the new capabilities that were introduced uh, just a few months ago at reInvent. So as always, no slides and lots of discussions and demos. Uh, all episodes are live. So please feel free to ask all your questions in the chat and our friendly moderators will answer them. OK, remember, you, there are no silly questions, so make sure you learn as much as possible. OK, let's get started. So Segolen, what is this episode about? So uh, in this episode, Vivian, uh, we are going to give you a grand tour of all the new SageMaker capabilities launched at uh, AWS reInvent, okay. the premier cloud conference in the world. In the uh, upcoming episode, uh, we will focus on a particular aspect of the ML lifecycle, such as um, data preparation, mm -hmm. training models, and so on. Okay, so it's kind of a recap today, exactly. and then uh, starting next week, actually, uh, we'll start diving into uh, particular things, but we need to set the scene first, okay? So before we do that, before we talk about the new capabilities, uh, we should start with a very quick recap on, uh, on SageMaker and uh, the story so far, so to speak. So a lot of you are probably new to, uh, to the topic, so we'll probably need to take a few minutes to bring you up to speed. So Amazon SageMaker was launched three years ago, and uh, it's a fully managed service that helps developers and data scientists quickly and easily go from experimentation to production using the same set of tools and the same Python SDK. Uh, the fully managed part is very important mm -hmm. because it means that you can focus on the machine learning problem and you never have to worry about infrastructure. Okay, So you never have to worry about starting, uh, instances and servers and you know, managing them or scaling them, all that stuff is taken care of automatically, right? So the only thing you have to do is pick the uh, Amazon EC2 instance type that you want to work with. Uh, maybe it's a CPU instance, maybe it's a GPU instance. We'll talk about that later as well. And so again, all the plumbing, so to speak, is abstracted away, right? And you can focus on your problem and uh, build a great machine learning model. And as usual with AWS, you only pay for what you use. Okay, so it's always uh, uh, pay as you go. Yeah, exactly. And uh, what, when it comes uh, to the machine learning process, you have full control. So uh, you can train and deploy models uh, based on a collection of scalable built-in algorithms, mm -hmm. uh, some of which have been invented by uh, Amazon. Yes. You can uh, also bring uh, your own code uh, written with uh, open source libraries like um, TensorFlow or PyTorch okay. and rely on your uh, optimized version to get the best performance. Mm -hmm. Or um, another option is uh, to bring your own uh, custom code, uh, for example, uh, some uh, custom Python or custom R. Yeah, and it's really important to understand that mm -hmm. uh, all training and deployment activities on SageMaker are actually based on Docker containers. Um, and don't worry if you're not familiar with Docker, you really, really don't need to know <laughs> much uh, on Docker to use SageMaker. And as long as you, your custom code fits in a Docker container, you can run it on SageMaker. So if you use uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch, you don't even need to worry about the containers. You just use the, the ones we provide. Mm -hmm. But if you want to use R, we can easily build an R container. Uh, we have examples, and you can run that on SageMaker. But we have more options mm -hmm. for uh, modeling. You can also use uh, a really nice capability called SageMaker Autopilot, which is an AutoML capability. 
uh, that lets you build models for uh, regression and uh, classification tasks. And it supports a variety of algorithms, including uh, neural networks now. And the, the really nice thing about autopilot is that you, you don't just get an optimized model. Uh, you also get auto-generated notebooks that show you how the model was trained, how the model was optimized with a hyperparameter optimization, and, uh, and of course, how data was prepared. Okay, so feature engineering and data prep is uh, fully transparent. So you can take those notebooks, you can run them yourself, you can tweak them, uh, and, and you get to understand exactly how the model was built. Yes, and uh, I really love uh, Autopilot, and uh, it recently added support uh, for uh, deep learning algorithm mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, it is important, yeah. Yeah, that's super important. And uh, there is uh, one more option oh. uh, we haven't mentioned. There's yet. always one more. Yeah, 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 <laughs> of course. Uh, you can also visit the AWS Marketplace for machine learning, mm -hmm. yes, uh, which hosts um, hundreds of uh, algorithm and pre-trained model built by uh, AWS partner okay. and deploy them on SageMaker in just a few clicks. So what about <laughs> developing? Uh, so we talked about building, building, deploying models. So how do we work with SageMaker? How do we write code for SageMaker? from a point of view of practice, um, from a tech development uh, perspective, you can use the uh, SageMaker SDK, uh, mm -hmm. your favorite uh, IDE. Which is a Python SDK. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, SageMaker also provides a full-fledged IDE called uh, SageMaker Studio, okay. um, where you can run uh, your notebooks, uh, visualize your training jobs, uh, manage your prediction endpoints, and of course, uh, work with uh, SageMaker advanced capabilities uh, like uh, automatic model tuning, mm. uh, model, model monitoring, and so on. Okay, and when we'll use uh, Studio today, yes, so you, you'll get a, you'll get a good look at Studio. So, speaking yes. of advanced capabilities, I think it's time to start the new season <laughs> for real, and we need to introduce all the new SageMaker characters just like in our favorite TV shows. So we have nine new characters, yeah, yeah. so let's quickly name them and then we can start uh, <laughs> diving into them. So uh, the first character, the first one is um, SageMaker uh, Data Wrangler uh, for data preparation. Mm -hmm. We've got another character, SageMaker Clarify uh, right. for uh, bias detection and model uh, explainability. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, SageMaker Feature Store, uh, offline and uh, online storage for your engineer uh, feature. Okay. We've got SageMaker's Jumpstart, uh, one click deployment for um, ML solutions and uh, pre trained models. Okay. We've got SageMaker <laughs> Data Parallelism, uh, yes. optimized for optimizing a large scale distributed training job. Okay. We've got uh, SageMaker Model Parallel. Parallelism um, for um, in order to automatically split and train a large model on the uh, GPU uh, clusters. Okay. Uh, if you want to uh, profile uh, capability in uh, SageMaker Debugger, uh, you can now collect and visualize um, training performance metrics uh, with no code change. Okay, yeah, that's a really, really nice one. Yes, yeah, but you're the nice. one as well. Very nice. <laughs> because yeah, SageMaker right. pipelines are <clears throat> uh, going to help you to uh, automate the model deployment uh, with end-to-end, uh, -end, uh, model deployment end-to-end -end with uh, quality gains. Yeah, pipelines, I love as well. Yeah, 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 <laughs> pipelines, good one. And uh, last but not least, we've got the SageMaker uh, Edge Manager um, in order to manage uh, multiple ML models on edge device. Okay, so today we're going to try and, and go through all nine, yeah. right? So that's a bit of a challenge, but I, we think we can manage that. And uh, and again, uh, starting next week, we'll start zooming in. So it's the start of the new season, I'm afraid. <laughs> I had no time to compose a musical theme. Uh, should I sing anything? No, no, no. okay, you. so I'm not singing anything. <laughs> all right, maybe next time. <laughs> So let's get started and uh, we'll go in logical order. Mm -hmm. uh, so we should start with data preparation. So data preparation is a huge part of machine learning projects. Okay? And we, uh, we routinely hear from customers that data prep takes 50, sometimes up to 80% yeah, of it's... their time. So why is that? And uh, what are the problems that customers typically face? So you're right, Julian. And um, for a data scientist like me, a data prep is very, very, very time consuming. 
and uh, we will get to that in a, in a, in a minute. But uh, however, uh, there is another problem uh, you may have to face before that, oh, okay. before the data prep. Another problem. <laughs> another <laughs> problem, okay. uh, which is uh, figuring out uh, if your data set mm -hmm. potentially contains biased data. Oh, oh yes. yes. Okay, that's terrible. <laughs> that's terrible. And because bias is really a growing concern for uh, social, uh, ethical, and uh, regulatory reason. And bias cannot be ignored anymore. Yeah, this is a really, really bad problem. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because honestly, no one wants to build unfair models and applications, right? We want machine learning to make a difference. We want machine learning to be positive. So if we build models that are actually, uh, you know, uh, discriminating against certain user groups or or you know just generally not being a, a good model that's that's awful so how does sage maker help here so this is where our first character uh, comes in it's uh, sage maker clarify okay. uh, sage maker clarify is a new capability uh, that lets you compute pre pre training bias metrics on your data sets mm -hmm. and uh, post training metrics on your trained models okay Everything runs on managed infrastructure, of course, and uh, you can visualize results in SageMaker Studio. Okay, so let's let's look at uh, an example, right? Cool. So um, let's uh, take a look at my screen, and uh, obviously I'm using SageMaker Studio here, right? So don't worry, we'll we'll come back to Studio many times during the season. As you can see, it's a web-based IDE, and I'm opening some notebooks here. So really what clarify lets you do is as you said compute bias metrics on the data mm -hmm. compute bias metrics on the models mm -hmm. and there's also a model explainability mm -hmm. uh capability which uh we won't discuss uh right now but again we'll, we'll cover that later on we are focusing on bias and it's it's really simple to use so you can see the code here and i'm zooming in on the exact uh, mm -hmm. snippet that uh, that's important so it's managed infrastructure. So we just create um, this uh, Sage Maker Clarify processor object saying, hey, please run my analysis on MLC4 X large, which is a, a let's say, mid size mm -hmm. uh, CPU instance, right? And we could get, we could pick bigger ones if we wanted. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to configure bias detection. Okay. And this really says, uh, I need to configure the data set. So mm -hmm. where's the data set? I want to analyze uh, what's the, the the name of the label mm -hmm. for that data set. Uh, what are the names of the columns? So basically describe the data set, okay? And then if you want to do a post-training analysis so on the model, you just need to say, okay, here's the model I want to analyze. Mm -hmm. the, and we already trained the model previously. Uh, and uh, and here's the infrastructure I want you to deploy the model on and, and run the analysis on, okay? And so this is as much infrastructure as you deal with, which is awesome. And then, then you need to specify the configuration for this mm -hmm. and say, okay, uh, so I want you to look for uh, potential bias mm -hmm. um, in this data set with respect to a certain feature, mm -hmm. okay? It's called a facet. And in this case, I want to, look for bias on uh, an attribute of feature called sex, which is basically uh, male or female, mm -hmm. uh, and we want to see what's going on here, okay? And don't worry, we'll come back to this uh, yeah. in detail, but this is really saying, okay, here's the, uh, the sensitive attribute in the data set that mm -hmm. I want to look at, mm -hmm. okay? And then you just run the analysis, okay, on, with your processor, and that's, that's it. And you say, please compute all the pre-training metrics, please compute all the post-training metrics, mm -hmm. And that uh, job runs, and you can see it runs on a, on, on a managed infrastructure. We automatically deploy the model. We compute all the, all the metrics, right? And here we see in the notebook, we have the output for all those metrics. And we can also look at them in SageMaker Studio in a much yes. user-friendly way, which we'll do next week, okay? But I'm just trying to give you a, a sneak preview here, okay? So we get the, all the metrics, and we can get information on how to integrate that. And now, of course, you get a you get a report. Uh, you get notebooks. Uh, notebook. You get a PDF file. You get an HTML yeah. file. And they're uh, in Amazon S3, a storage service. And you can just go in. Mm -hmm. And that's it. So it, you can see it's uh, 
it's very little code. Configure your uh, your setup and just run your run your analysis on managed infrastructure. Okay, and then interpret the metrics. So that that's really really nice. Um, and um, and we'll dive actually we'll dive deep into this one uh, next week. Okay, uh, don't miss it. Right. Okay. So this is what I can tell you about Firefly. <laughs> yeah, and um, just to, to summarize a little bit, so uh, a clarify uh, may, can make it easy uh, to detect uh, potential bias uh, issues uh, early. <laughs> yes. We are we are streaming, right? Yeah. Uh, you can then uh, investigate if uh, the, these bias uh, are real, uh, what has, what their business impact is, uh, and so on. Uh, then uh, you can take action uh -huh. to do a bias correction, uh, okay. such as uh, rebalancing the training sample, pre-training, uh, uh. using smooth algorithms, for instance, okay. uh, adjust labels on the training data sets, uh, adjust cutoff uh, as mm, well, sure. adjust cutoff uh, post-modeling, add more data, and so on. Yeah, and uh, we'll actually do this uh, next week. Uh, we'll, we'll show you how to do rebalancing mm -hmm. and, uh, and so on. I'm still working on the code. It's, uh, <laughs> it's almost almost ready, okay? <laughs> okay, so now we, we get a better understanding of this uh, initial problem, mm -hmm. right? So can we please talk about data preparation now? Unless there is another problem we don't talk about. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> okay, so data prep. So what are the tasks that are typically involved in data prep? So now we are going to talk about the second character of uh, this new season, which mm -hmm. is uh, SageMaker Data Bangle. Okay. Because um, on top of uh, cleaning data, you often need you often need to transform it into a more expressive form uh, that make it easier for the algorithm to learn. Okay. This whole process uh, is called uh, feature engineering, uh -huh. and usually involves a lot. A lot, a lot of yeah. manual work um, with a collection of tools. Okay. Yeah, and we all use, you know, our own scripts and our own recipes and, and open source tools, etc. Um, and they're great, right? But we're trying to make this whole process a little bit simpler. Yeah. And I think this is where Data Wrangler mm -hmm. uh, fits, right? Trying to uh, unify, standardize mm -hmm. uh, your uh, data cleaning, data preparation process. Is that Correct. Exactly, and um, using uh, SageMaker uh, Data Wrangler, gonna use uh, an intuitive uh, UI uh, uh -huh. in uh, SageMaker Studio, and thanks to that, uh, you will be able to import uh, tabular data okay. and apply over uh, 300 um, building transforms, okay. uh, as well as your own uh, in Python, uh, PySpark, and uh, Spark SQL. Okay. Uh, for instance, the LOTI uh, use uh, Data Wrangler uh, to accelerate uh, the process of uh, machine learning data preparation, mm -hmm. and uh, this helps their uh, own customer uh, take their uh, new products to market much quicker. Yeah, which makes sense because if if you know we just said data prep can take you know eighty percent of your time, so any speed up oh, yeah. here is mm -hmm. going to be a huge improvement exactly. in your project, and, well and you can iterate yeah, much quicker. Course. Okay, so let's take a look at my screen and um, and see data render in action. Okay, so again, going back to Studio, um, the first step is to actually import data. So uh, here I'm going to import from Amazon S3. And let me grab, uh, let me grab something from one of my buckets. There's so much stuff here. Yes. So uh, I'm just I'm going to quickly show you an example with a Titanic survivor data set, which is a toy data set. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, but it's it's a good one. So uh, it's a CSV file. Uh, you know, when I select it, you can see I get a preview, right? So I can confirm this is what I want, and I can import this data set, okay? And uh, and I can start uh, I can start preparing it. Uh, or I could yeah I could uh, uh, analyze it first maybe. So we could uh, we could do some visualization quickly, uh, so we, you can build histograms and scatter plots, and we can have table summary, uh, and uh, let's just use that name. Uh, okay, we can run you know the typical stats and mm -hmm. build the typical uh, um, the typical uh, histograms and graphs that that we like to build. Okay. 
And uh, and then we could say, okay, now uh, again, I'm going quite quickly. We'll go deeper into this next week. We could start adding transforms. So here's the list, right? Mm -hmm. You said 300 plus. We're not going to count. Yes. <laughs> uh, and we can see we can use custom code as well. Panda, uh, yeah, PySpark, Python, pandas, and SQL. Uh, and just to show you, maybe I want to say, hey, uh, so let's drop. Let's uh, drop a column in the middle. The name column is probably not super important. So we'll just say, OK, drop column name. Uh, we can preview the change and add it to the pipeline. And then you could say, why don't we, we could encode maybe, uh, this is a categorical variable. We could say encode categorical. Uh, we could do one hot encoding, why not, uh, on uh, sex um, and output style let's have one column per value and we can just give a prefix maybe like this we can preview and we certainly see those two categories cool. here and we can say add etc etc mm -hmm, okay mm -hmm. again we'll we'll uh, we'll look at this in more detail next week and and so we can see uh, the different steps uh, being involved here in our pipeline, we could have multiple sources, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and then uh, we could just uh, export, of course, um, this, uh, this pipeline uh, to, uh, to actual code, right? So um, we could say, um, let's, oops, uh, we could take those steps and we could export them to um, uh, a, a Python notebook, mm -hmm. a SageMaker processing job, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so there are there are really lots of ways uh, you can you can work with this, and uh, and then integrate this code into your own application, mm -hmm. all right? And you can see the uh, the preparation step is really is really very really simple. Yeah. Right? It's really about just manually and and visually adding transforms and then exporting the code and using that. OK, um, so that's what I can tell you about data render in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and now, and after regarding the exportation, um, as you, you, we, we saw, and I will, we will dive deep next week, uh, all it takes um, for the exportation is one click. Huh? Um, you have four options, so you can export it to uh, Python code for a direct integration in your ML project. Uh -huh. Or, as you said, uh, we can use the SageMaker uh, processing yeah. notebook yeah, for... See, uh, yeah, you can see that on my screen. Oh, yeah, perfect. Please keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, message maker processing notebook for uh, fully managed uh, batch uh, processing. Uh, we got as well a uh, stage maker pipelines notebook for end-to-end um, -end automation. And uh, the, the last option is a stage maker uh, feature store notebook uh -huh. to store engineer feature for offline and uh, online use. Online use, sorry. Yeah, it's actually a good transition because yeah. the, uh, <laughs> the, the next service we want to talk about is Sage and Feature Store, which is another important part of uh, data preparation, right? Mm -mm -mm -mm. So what should we know about this one? <laughs> so um, when we talk about uh, feature engineering, engineering, uh, engineering um, sometimes and most of the time, uh, the same feature engineering code uh, is often run again and again, uh, wasting time and uh, compute resources and uh, repeating the same operation. Uh, in large organization, uh, this can cause an even uh, greater loss of productivity uh, as different teams uh, often run uh, identical jobs or even write uh, duplicate feature engineering code because they have no knowledge of uh, prior work. Mm, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, that's pretty bad. very yeah. pretty bad, not very common. So, um, and another problem is that uh, it's uh, imperative that you apply uh, the same transformation to data, to data uh, same for prediction. Uh, this uh, often uh, means rewriting re uh, feature uh, engineering code, uh, sometimes in a different language, uh, integrating it in your uh, prediction workflow, and uh, running, it, running, running it at uh, prediction time. This uh, whole process is not only uh, time-consuming, uh, but it can also introduce uh, 
inconsistencies, of mm -hmm. course, as uh, even the tiniest uh, variation uh, in a data transform can have a large impact on uh, prediction. Yeah, so all, all these problems, again, are a huge source of, you know, inefficiency yeah. and mm -hmm. time wasting and bug chasing. Mm -hmm. So uh, how does SageMaker Future Store help solve this? So um, this other this another character is uh, actually super useful uh, because uh, SageMaker Feature Store is a fully managed uh, centralized uh, repository for your uh, ML feature, mm -hmm. making it uh, easy to uh, securely store and retrieve uh, feature without having to manage any infrastructure. So uh, features are uh, organized in groups and tag, tag uh, with uh, metadata, mm -hmm. helping you uh, discover uh, which features are uh, already available. Okay. And uh, for instance, uh, thanks to uh, SageMaker Feature Store, uh, Intuit uh, no longer has to maintain uh, multiple feature uh, repositories across the organization. Uh, instead, uh, their data scientist will be able to use uh, existing feature from a, a central store. Okay, nice. And uh, one store uh, feature uh, can be retrieved uh, and used uh, in your SageMaker workflows, uh, such as uh, used in uh, model training, uh, batch transform, mm -hmm. and uh, real time prediction uh, with low latency. Okay. So the thing is, not only uh, you avoid uh, du duplicating work, but uh, you also build uh, consistent workflows. Uh, that use uh, the same consistent feature store in the uh, offline and uh, online online stores. Okay, so run feature engineering once, store the features, mm -hmm. and then use them for training, for prediction, exactly, and share them with other teams. Exactly. Right? Okay, so this sounds awesome. like a, a really cool addition. <clears throat> so let's see uh, how this works. Um, so let's go back to my screen and let me put my demo glasses on. <laughs> And this is actually, uh, so while Segalen was actually talking, I exported my uh, very fancy data preparation pipeline on the Titanic data set to, uh, this, uh, to this notebook, right? Um, and so again, don't worry, we'll come back to Sage Hunter Future Store in, in a lot of detail in future episodes. Uh, I'm just giving you again, quick sense of, of the capability here. So we're going to create what we call a feature group. Okay, so feature group is just it's a, it's an abstraction in in the feature store, where we store uh, the rows with the uh, engineered features. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, think of it as the equivalent of your uh, you know your SQL table or your CSV file, mm -hmm. but in engineering in engineered format. Okay, and we we give a schema right. Uh, we need to have the right types for all those all those columns. Uh, and uh, yes, you can see uh, you can see uh, the features that I actually engineer here, right? So we have this on um, uh, this is auto generated for us, but you could also write your own schema if you were mm -hmm. not exporting from Data Wrangler. Uh, we need to pass the name of a unique identifier for each row, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which could be like a primary key or you know something that comes from your data set and that uniquely identifies each row because that's what you're going to use to query mm -hmm. the features for a certain row okay uh, and then then we decide to create an online store okay so that's the low latency store we're going to use at prediction time to mm -hmm. retrieve the features and of course we have the offline store which is based in s3 uh, where we'll get all our features and where we can uh, query to build training data sets. Okay, and then we create the feature group, mm -hmm. right, with this uh, API call, and and that's about it. And uh, and then you can start ingesting uh, your data, right? Uh, so you can just uh, you can bulk ingest uh, your data, or you can put individual records. And, and then either you retrieve them for online prediction or you uh, can run queries on the S3 mm -hmm. objects mm -hmm. in, in the offline store and build training sets. Okay, and we'll show you a demo of that later on in the season. But really, it, it all comes down to this, right? Um, create a feature group, mm -hmm. define a schema for it, decide if you want uh, on online storage, which is really just say, hey, I want it through 
um, say where the offline uh, data needs to be stored and call this API and just ingest, okay, which is again one line of code later in the notebook. So it is really, really super simple. And uh, you can also, of course, uh, we, we'll, we said we'll show you Studio and here Studio. Uh, you can also create a feature group in the Studio UI. So uh, just go to this uh, icon here, you can select Feature Store and you create a feature group. And then basically you'll find the same thing that I just described, right? But I'm more of an API guy. So I always show the API first, <laughs> yeah. Complain about it, but I won't change. Uh, but if you're a more of a UI person, that's okay, because you have a UI. So a feature group name, uh, you enable online storage and offline storage, passing the same parameters. Uh, and if you continue, then you'll pass your schema and, and then that's about it. So it's very, very simple. And then you can again query uh, and retrieve features and, and get to work, okay? So very, very, yeah, very cool service, very cool service. Okay, but there's so much more that yeah. covers. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we have to move on. And the next step, so we covered data prep with uh, Clarify, Data Wrangler, and Feature Store. Mm -hmm. Now we're moving to training, right? Oh, uh, sorry. Building. <laughs> building. <laughs> yeah, because I'm so excited about distributed <laughs> training. That's why. Sorry. We'll talk about training too. We're talking about building models now. So as discussed in detail, uh, in season two, mm -hmm. right? And you can go and, and watch those episodes as well. Uh, they're online. You have lots of options to build ML models, right? So built-in algos, built-in frameworks, your own code in a Docker container, uh, SageMaker Autopilot, SageMaker uh, Machine Learning Marketplace. <laughs> so seriously, uh, Sego, isn't this enough, right? Do, do we really need something else? Yes. <laughs> Okay. All right. Tell me more. <laughs> and uh, indeed, SageMaker has a lot of options. However, you know, some customers uh, who don't have a lot of uh, ML experience uh, may find it difficult to train and deploy uh, state-of-the-art models on SageMaker. Fair enough. Also, uh, experienced practitioners may want to uh, quickly experiment with uh, different model models trained on uh, reference data sets shortlisting a few and uh, fine-tuning them uh, on their own data. Yes, okay. Yeah. So obviously, if if you've ever tried to deploy uh, models like BERT, oh, yeah. my favorite, <laughs> or, or one of the many variants yeah, of yeah, BERT, yeah. Uh, I'm sure you certainly wasted some time, or maybe a lot of time in my case, uh, and, and trying to deploy, trying to predict. Mm -hmm. And certainly, you know, you got frustrated. Of course. And I know I, know yeah. I was. <laughs> So, can you help me here? Yes, no, not me, but just I mean, SageMaker jumpstart. Um, because this is exactly the problem uh, that uh, SageMaker jumpstart is aimed um, at. Okay. Again, in just one click, uh, you can deploy hundreds of uh, state of the art models for um, computer vision and uh, natural language processing. Uh -huh. Once the prediction endpoint is up, you can use a prediction code uh, provided by SageMaker and immediately predict with your own samples. Oh, I, I can copy paste? <laughs> <laughs> yes, more or less, but oh, okay. uh, there is no more frustration uh, trying to uh, figure out uh, the data format expected by um, the endpoint. Okay, nice, very nice. Jumpstarts also uh, lets you deploy end-to-end -end, uh, solution that solve a specific business problem, mm -hmm. like detection uh, in financial transaction okay. or uh, on writing recognition. Okay. Just one click. And AWS cloud formation, our um, infrastructure as code service. Mm -hmm. um, um, so yes, AWS cloud formation will uh, de deploy the uh, appropriate AWS resources. Okay. Within a few minutes, you can start running the sample notebooks. Okay, so I love this. It's exactly what I need. I keep saying, you know, laziness is a virtue, and uh, we're going to look at some examples. Okay, demo glasses, <laughs> and let's go to my screen. And uh, this is the home screen for SageMaker Jumpstart. Mm -hmm. And indeed, you can see we have solutions. We have text models, so NLP models, mm -hmm. uh, computer vision models, and we have more examples for SageMaker algos. We have example, notebooks, we have blogs, we have video tutorials. Oh my God. Yeah, there's a lot to, to <laughs> learn, but we're going to focus on the top three here. 
Uh, and uh, so if you open uh, if you open uh, solutions, indeed you can see there's a, there are solutions available here. Okay. And uh, if you uh, if you select one, uh, so I selected the uh, detect malicious users yeah. and transactions solution. We can see obviously there's a bit of a, of a story on what this is. Uh, there's uh, uh, the architecture that mm -hmm. you're going to deploy the cloud formation. And I seem to remember we actually yeah, used yeah, this yeah. example in last in the last season. Yeah, so yeah. it's really cool to see it's part of uh, Sage Drinker Studio now. And you can go and watch this episode on uh, fraud detection. And again, there's description on what we do and what the data set is. Okay, so well, what you need to know, right? That's great. And then one click and you launch this solution. Okay, and it runs a cloud formation template. You wait for a few minutes. And then you get to this screen that says, yeah, ready to go. Uh, and if you click on open notebook, then you automatically open the notebook that shows you the actual uh, the actual code and uh, and what this uh, use case is actually about and how it's solved for SageMaker. So this is a great resource to yeah. learn. Mm -hmm. uh, I cannot, if you're new with to, to machine learning, and, and SageMaker, I cannot recommend enough that you actually look at all the solutions. It's probably the best way to learn. You know, run the code, understand how this works. Uh, I mean, I, I keep learning stuff when I when I use this, and and it's a good starting point. Maybe exactly, right? uh, exactly. if you have this particular business problem, this is a good place to start, mm -hmm. and you can tweak it and add your data, etc. So uh, actually, a lot of the solutions have multiple notebooks. Um, so the, the, I would say the basic one and then the more advanced one. So again, very, very nice resource here. Okay. So as we said, uh, Jumpstart also has models. So if we go back to Jumpstart here, we see plenty of NLP models. Hey, my friend Bert is here <laughs> and plenty of computer vision model. Okay. So let's take a look at that. Um, so here, let's start with an NLP model. And I selected a, a BERT uh, variant trained for question answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this particular model uh, will find the answer in a in a piece of text mm -hmm. um, that you provide. Okay, so you give it a bit of text, ask a question about that text, mm -hmm. and then it finds the answer. So you can see for a lot of those models, you can deploy them as is, right? And as you explained, they are pre-trained, or you can fine-tune them, which is great because fine-tuning those complex State of the art models is not very easy if you to try to do to do it all of it manually, and so you can bring your own data. Um, there's a there's a, a default data set that you can use for quick check, or or you can actually enter a location for your own data. Okay, so here I deployed the the, the pre-trained model. Okay, so clicked on this, wait a few minutes. And then you have an endpoint, so say your endpoint, which is in service. And once again, click on open notebook, and guess what? You open a sample notebook again. And for a lazy guy like me, this is great <laughs> because I get some samples that I can try. So what is Southern California, abbreviated is. And, and this is the bit of text that has the answer and who directed Spectre, which is a, a James Bond movie, and of course, you get the text and the answer is somewhere in there, right? And we get to see uh, the invocation code. Mm -hmm. and this is typically where I waste a lot of time trying mm -hmm. to figure out how to invoke the endpoint, what data the format, format. Uh, what format, format data format. should yeah, be yeah, in, yeah. Mm -hmm. what format the answer is in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, those models tend to have crazy um, uh, uh, prediction responses, mm -hmm. uh, really difficult to understand. So not so much here, but uh, this is all taken care of. And I can run this example on my code, on my samples, and I can see here's the question, right? And the answer is SoCal. So that's the magic of those models. They, they give you just the perfect answer to, to the question, right? And who directed Spectre? It's Sam Mendes. So it's it's a on perfect laser focused answer. And, uh, and I guess this is why BERT is a, it's a popular model these days. Yeah. It works very well. And the only thing I've done here is click on deploy model, and I can literally take that code and tweak it, and it's fine, right? Um, so this is this is really cool. Uh, I, uh, here's another example mm -hmm. with a computer vision model. So it's a single shot detector, uh, object detection model. 
again, I could deploy it or fine tune it, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and there's always a bit of an extra explanation here if you want to read. Uh, so I deployed it, it's in service, open the notebook, and once again, I get, uh, so this is the sample image. Mm -hmm. uh, so nice sub, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I hope we can go back to yeah, something yeah. like this. <laughs> Uh, hopefully you're in a place that's not in lockdown or curfew, <laughs> right? So if you're in a place like this right now, we're so yeah, we're so jealous. <laughs> we're so jealous. Um, and then we can send the image to the endpoint, right? And uh, and typically SSDs have crazy mm -hmm. prediction responses, right? Because they have all the bounding boxes, and and it, it's really difficult to 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 write that code yourself. But here. It's already provided, right? So we have the code sample that actually decodes the, the response and and draws the bounding boxes on the on your test image. And you can literally cut and paste that code and use it in your app. So this is a huge, huge time saver. I'm a big fan yeah. of uh, of Jamstar, right? Uh, so that's what I wanted to tell you, right? <laughs> no, and honestly, I really like yes, stage maker Jamstar because. Um, as you, as we see, it's it's really an easy way to uh, deploy and try try out uh, complex models and solutions. But now I think it's time to um, move on to the next step ah, of let the... me guess <laughs> <laughs> training. Yes, oh, thank right. you. that's my favorite part. <laughs> so to, to, we are going now to talk about um, the uh, training part, training how to train a model and how stage maker helps you. Okay, so training is is uh, you know we tend to think it's kind of a solved problem, but mm -hmm. it's only solved for a little bit because as data sets and models get ever bigger, mm -hmm. uh, training or even fine tuning them uh, continues to be a challenge, mm -hmm. right? Of course, infrastructure is is more and more powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we keep innovating on on infrastructure, but it's it's not enough. Right, uh, it's not just it's not enough to just say, "Hey, we have the fast and hardware." You need to have scalable software to uh, to help you uh, train on that cool infrastructure. And of course, SageMaker has uh, has had uh, distributed training from day one. Mm -hmm. For me, it was actually one of the most inter interesting things because setting up distributed training on your own is is not so easy, right? And for SageMaker, it was just one line and. and and it was so easy. And, uh, and it uses open source libraries like uh, Horovald and uh, PyTorch distributed data parallel, which I'm sure you work with. Um, and a few months ago, uh, we added new libraries mm. uh, to, to, uh, to add, uh, to, to speed up, sorry, <laughs> distributed training. And, uh, and it's using a new technique, an improved technique for data parallelism. So if you're not familiar with data parallelism, it's, it's, Pretty easy to understand. So, if you have a large data set, and let's say you have uh, you know 16 GPUs mm -hmm. that you are in your cluster, you split your data set in 16 chunks, mm -hmm. and you only send you only send one chunk to each GPU. So each GPU is training on a fraction of the data set, right? And mm -hmm. so obviously uh, things will go faster because you don't train. Uh, you don't send the full data set to each GPU, right? Mm -hmm. So there are many ways to actually implement it, but as you can imagine, if you have a large data set, it's important that communication mm -hmm. between those GPUs uh, is super optimized because yeah. it's a huge bottleneck, <laughs> yeah. okay? And this is what the new data parallelism library does. So it, uh, it can scale to data sets that are hundreds or even thousands of gigabytes. So that's petabytes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's quite big, but we have customers who do this, trust me. Yes. And this is available for TensorFlow and PyTorch. And in a nutshell, it implements a super efficient distribution of computation across the training cluster, mm -hmm. right? And by optimizing network communication, you can actually um, fully utilize our fastest GPU instances like uh, the P3 family and the P4 family. And what you want is you really want the GPUs to be crunching data. Mm -hmm. You don't want the GPUs to be transferring or waiting for data to be transferred. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's a waste. 
So we eliminate a lot of the, of those transfers, mm -hmm. and we 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 focus the GPUs on what they do best, which is crunching. Right. And thanks to this, we get near linear scaling, uh, regardless of the number of GPUs involved. So if you double the number of GPUs in your cluster, uh, you'll pretty much get twice the speed. Right. So you don't have to do any trade-off on training cost and training time because any any extra hardware you add is going to be used yes. efficiently, right? So it's money well spent, right? Yeah, and I think it is really a huge step uh, forward because um, let give me let give you let me, let me give you a concrete example. Uh, last year at reInvent, uh, we trained uh, Masker CNN, uh, which is a general framework for uh, object instance. Uh, segmentation on ImageNet in uh, 26 minutes in PyTorch, on PyTorch, sorry, and in uh, 27 minutes on TensorFlow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we recorded the fastest training time to date with six minutes and 12 seconds on TensorFlow and six, six minutes and 45 seconds on uh, PyTorch. And wow. this is, yeah. Six minutes to train Masper CNN yeah. on ImageNet. Instead of 26. Wow. So I did that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, honestly, this is and this is thanks to the new data parallelism library. And uh, maybe uh, let's take a sneak peek uh, at an example, as you will see, mm -hmm. uh, using uh, this library again doesn't require a lot of code change. Yeah, so let's uh, let's show my screen and and take a look at uh, at a simple example. Again, we'll cover this. It's a fascinating topic, and uh, and we'll uh, come back to this later on. Um, so basically, uh, what you need to do to use um, this new data parallelism library is to uh, first you need to add a parameter to your TensorFlow estimator. So the estimator in the Sage Recur SDK is the object that you use to configure your training. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you've never seen SageMaker before, well, you can just read this and I guess it makes sense, right? We're we're using Python 3.7 and TensorFlow 231, and we want to train on two uh, pretty large P3 uh, instances. So again, and, and uh, the, the code uh, that we want to use for tr to train the model is in this uh, script, okay? And so you, all you have to do is add this parameter. Say, hey, please enable the data parallel library. Mm -hmm. So even I can do that. <laughs> Very simple. And in in your own training code, okay, you need to define a function mm -hmm. and annotate it, uh, decorate it with this annotation. Mm -hmm. And and this function is really the function that runs uh, forward propagation and computes the loss okay and uh and that's about it okay and uh and computes the gradient and returns the loss value so this is a very a very i would say generic way of uh of um, writing your code and and the reason that the reason why you have to do this is because this is the function that actually gets uh distributed so to speak right uh, this is the function that gets distributed to the uh, to the GPU. So you just need to annotate it to to tell to the library this is where you need to split the data and mm -hmm. this is where you need to you know optimize communication, right? So it's uh, you can you can probably take your existing TensorFlow code and just you know annotate it and uh, and use this uh, distributed gradient tape, which is how we record. Uh, gradients, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, during uh, during forward and then backward propagation. So pretty simple. Uh, again, we have sample notebooks, and we'll come back to that. But it's literally a couple of only a couple of lines you need to add to your script, and then you can uh, enjoy this uh, this very efficient distributed uh, data parallelism framework. That's great. So pretty cool. And yeah, yeah we'll, we'll come back to that with a, a real life example. Okay. All right, so that's it for data parallelism. Um, so now mm -hmm. there is another one. Right? <laughs> yes, of course. And this one is easy, even crazier. Oh, yes. Yeah, I love this one. So what about <laughs> very large models? And when I say large, right, I mean <laughs> things like, uh, you know, large transformers, like T5, 3B, which, as the name implies, has 3 billion parameters. Three million. Three billion with a B, not million. <laughs> billion. 
Okay. And, uh, and, and, you know, models like, uh, you know, GPT-2, GPT-3, I mean, they're even bigger. So they're so large that you won't fit them into GPU memory. Even if you have the, the largest GPU available today, they just don't fit in memory. So if you want to train them, right, uh, you have to split them manually. You have to train one part of the model on the one GPU and another part, so another few, a bunch of layers on another model, on another GPU, and then yet another layer, another bunch of layers <laughs> on yet another GPU. And it's like, it, it, it sounds like, you know, it sounds like madness to do this. Like, yeah. Split your model and train My different name, parts yeah. on different GPUs. Or, or there are other techniques like gradient checkpointing, mm -hmm. which are pretty costly, you know, saving your gradients to disk and then uh, and then uh, training another part of the model and then saving that to disk again. And so do we have a better option in Sage? Yes. Ah, <laughs> I like you. Ah, yes, 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 of course. And uh, SageMaker um, also um, in, add, added a model parallelism library um, in uh, no, so I <laughs> also added a model parallelism library. Um, what it means? It means that uh, it automatically uh, and efficiently partition models across several GPUs, okay. um, eliminating the need for uh, accuracy compromise or for uh, complex manual work. In addition, uh, thanks to this scale out approach to uh, model training, not only you can work uh, with very large models uh, without any memory bottleneck, mm -hmm. uh, but you can also leverage a large number of uh, smaller and more uh, cost-effective GPUs. Sure. Okay. That's important. And um, this is supported for uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch. And again, it only requires a minimal change uh, in your code. Okay, so let's show my screen and um, let's uh, show you how you can configure this. Yeah. So uh, this time, this is a PyTorch example. And again, uh, in your estimator, uh, you have to pass an extra, um, an extra parameter to mm -hmm. enable model parallelism. And, and we have extra parameters here, um, which I won't go into, but we'll, we'll cover them later in the season. Uh, and this pretty much drives the level of parallelism you want. Uh, you want in your in your training cluster. You know how how many times when you split the models, so that's partitions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But these are not so uh, so difficult to to come up with, okay. And this is it, right? <laughs> so you actually do not need. Mm -hmm. to change anything in your code in this case. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like magic because how could you think that, oh, automatically, you know, this is going to split my model and run, you know, forward propagation for these layers on GPU one and, and run forward propagation for our, and the rest of the layers on GPU two. Uh, so the way this works, as we'll see later in the mm -hmm. season, is when you fire up you, this training job, there's a profiling step that uh, is actually uh, uh, running early on, that looks at the model, how many layers it has, how big they are, how many memory they require, et cetera, et cetera. And then it takes partitioning decision and starts to allocate certain layers on certain uh, GPUs. And, uh, and that's, that's all you need to do. So th this is really, to me, this is completely magical. Yeah. And, uh, and here it's a very simple example, but uh, we'll, we'll try and show you a really big example uh, later in the season, and then you'll see how this works mm -hmm. uh, and how we can train really, really large model. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so this is pretty cool. So, model parallelism and data parallelism uh, with those two mm -hmm. characters, it looks like we're we have our scaling covered, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. for a little while. Uh, but yet, yeah, there's another problem. Uh, what about understanding? Uh, performance, training performance problems. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you, you run your training job and it's slow, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you, it's very hard to figure out why. So uh, is there any hope to understand how, how well or how bad the training job is running and how, how well or how bad it's using our infrastructure? Uh, you're right. Uh, it's a very hard. It is a very. Uh, it is really a hard problem to. Um, maybe it was a very hard problem to understand uh, how well or how, how bad the training job uh, was. 
But um, of course, uh, SageMaker sends uh, monitoring information to uh, Amazon CloudWatch. Yeah, but so CloudWatch is our monitoring service. Yeah, exactly. It's integrated with pretty much every AWS service. Mm -hmm. So we get to see, you know, some infrastructure metrics. Okay, but. but Sometimes uh, this is not enough yeah. uh, to identify and fix uh, code level uh, training bottlenecks and a similar issue. For this purpose, uh, uh, we added a new profiling uh, capability to uh, Amazon SageMaker, which is Amazon SageMaker Debugger. <laughs> yeah, so Debugger is, is, is very nice. Uh, it was actually launched uh, over a year ago, uh, so the debugging capability. Uh, figuring out training issues uh, related to uh, uh, convergence or uh, et cetera, et cetera. And now you can also actually profile the mm -hmm. performance. And you know why I love it so much? Because it doesn't require any change to your code, right? Yeah. So again, you can take your existing training code and you can profile it uh, without changing anything in here, right? So this is this is pretty nice. Yeah, and uh, profiling is uh, now available for uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is uh, to train with the corresponding built-in frameworks uh, in SageMaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, distributed training is also supported uh, out of the box. Nice. Setting a single uh, parameter in your uh, SageMaker estimator. And uh, without any change to your training code, you can enable the collection of uh, infrastructure and uh, model metrics, such as, of course, CPU and GPUs, mm -hmm. RAM and GPU RAM, uh, network I.O., uh, storage I.O., uh, Python metrics, uh, data loading time, mm -hmm. uh, time spent uh, in ML operators running on uh, CPU and GPUs, uh, distributed training metrics for Overboard, and many, many more. Okay, yeah, so it's really much more than the, yeah. the graphs that we had in, in CloudWatch so far. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. Particularly the operator level information. Exactly. It's yeah. very cool. This yeah. is really where you can, uh, you can fix and see, understand what's happening under the list. And um, in addition, you can visualize uh, how much time uh, is spent uh, in different phases, such as um, pre processing, uh, training loop, and uh, post processing. If needed, uh, you can drill down uh, on each training epoch and even on each function uh, in your training script. Okay, so yeah, no code changes. No, no. no. Right, I love that. <laughs> let's look at an example. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at my screen. And uh, this is an example with PyTorch again. So um, just like for SageMaker debugger, uh, trying to figure out, you know, debugging uh, uh, actual training issues, um, the profiler also uses rules. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have built-in rules um, like you know low GPU utilization and, and a few more. So if we're looking for specific problems, we can enable those rules, and uh, and if they're detected during the training job. Uh, we get a notification through uh, Amazon CloudWatch events, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, the event service uh, associated to CloudWatch. And this could be sent and, uh, to a queue, or this could be sent to a Lambda function, and we could act on it. We could kill the job saying, well, if, if GPU utilization is 1%, you know, why do we even continue? Like, we should kill that job automatically and, and save time and money. So we can configure some rules mm -hmm. looking for specific problems. Uh, and then we configure the, the actual profiling job, right? So we get to uh, here, this is a simple setup where uh, we set the, the, the date of capture interval to uh, 500 milliseconds. Okay, we can, we, can have, uh, we can go down, I think, uh, to 100 milliseconds. Wow. It's gonna be a lot of data, but if mm -hmm. you really wanna know what's going on, that's useful. Uh, we could uh, capture uh, data for specific steps, mm -hmm. training steps. Maybe you don't want to capture data for your whole job, maybe mm -hmm. just a specific section. Why not? Okay. And then, uh, as usual, you configure your estimator and mm -hmm. you pass that profiler, profiler yeah, config, config, right? And you start your training job. And that's it, right? Um, and then, of course, data, so rules uh, will, be, uh, uh, will be checked during the training job. Uh, and also, data is collected. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, it's stored in uh, S3. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, yeah. 
in near real time. Mm -hmm. right? I don't want to say real time because we never agree on what real time means, but <laughs> it's in near real time. So as the training job is running, you get data in S3 mm -hmm. uh, profiling information, and you can write your own uh, code to to access that data, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, you can also see it in studio, okay? Ooh, yeah. uh, and so you see, uh, so this is the summary. So uh, you would only get to see the summary, obviously, at the end of the job. And it gives you information about usage, um, right? Uh, percentiles, uh, the most important, uh, the most time consuming uh, compute intensive operations. So this is a computer vision example. Mm -hmm. So obviously convolution mm -hmm. is uh, is the top operator here. You can see 17% is count to D. So yeah, a lot of time, almost 60, 70% is convolution only. Uh, we can see uh, uh, insights, right? So we see that low GPU utilization that would configure was actually triggered quite a few times. Um, and we get extra information on, okay, what this means and how to fix it. Um, looks like the batch size rule was triggered as well, et cetera, et cetera. So this really, you know, it, it really points at very precise uh, performance issues and uh, and it gives you extra information on how to uh, how to solve them, okay? And- Super interesting. And yeah, and if you look at nodes, oh, I'm gonna try and reload this, but Okay, it won't load. Okay, sorry. So here, this is where you actually see uh, the, the 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 real time information, mm -hmm. um, the real time information, and the, how, how the nodes, you know, how much, uh, uh, well, CPU and GPU usage over time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, uh, and you can download a full report as well. Okay. All right. Uh, so I think this is what I wanted to uh, to tell you about uh, about the profiler. And again, we'll we'll try and run something big on this, and see how it happens, and try to show you real time information. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. All right. Um, maybe one just we, we mentioned clarify right mm -hmm. early on, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we said there's a model explainability mm -hmm. uh, feature in clarify. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, you know, we're not going to go into it today. We'll we'll dive into this later. Um, but what you can do with this is uh, uh, you can use Clarify to understand how your model predicts. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is based on a well-known library called SHAP. Uh, Shapley additive values. Shapley right? <laughs> <laughs> <Right? laughs> additive values, <laughs> uh, which again we covered in season two. Right? Yeah, exactly. And and uh, so it computes uh, SHAP values. For your data set, uh, you know, displays a summary in the studio, and you get uh, individual sharp values for each sample in the in the data set uh, in S3 as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, that's uh, I guess it's part of understanding uh, how the model works and something you would want to do during training mm -hmm. as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, pretty pretty important. Okay, so I think now uh, we're done with training. So quite a lot of stuff about training, right? Yeah, Remember, yeah. model parallelism, data parallelism, um, profiling, performance yeah. issues, and model explainability. Right? Yeah. Uh, now it's time to move to, I think, the last part of this presentation, which is model deployment. <laughs> so tell us everything. <laughs> no, that is the cherry on the cake. No, um, so we are going to talk about uh, our next character, which is uh, SageMaker Pipeline. And um, the next step uh, for any machine learning project after the training is, of course, um, deploying uh, your model in production. Mm -hmm. And uh, the new uh, SageMaker Pipeline capability is really uh, the cherry on the cake. Uh, as it brings uh, best-in-class DevOps uh, practice to your uh, ML project. Um, this new capability makes it easy and uh, easier for uh, data scientists and uh, ML developers to uh, create uh, automated and reliable end-to-end -end ML pipelines. Okay. And as usual with SageMaker, uh, all infrastructure is fully managed and doesn't require uh, any work uh, on your side. So it's 
DevOps, <laughs> right? The DevOps philosophy, the DevOps mindset and, and, and concepts apply to machine learning. Mm -hmm. And it's it's probably the number one pain point for our customers yeah. today. You know, like I said, training is pretty well understood now. Mm -hmm. And the tools to run and scale training are pretty well uh, understood. But deployment is still painful. Mm -hmm. So this is what people call ML ops. Yeah, exactly. They love inventing new buzzwords. So we'll call it ML ops. That's fine, right? Uh, and <laughs> it's, true, it's true. It's like the devout practice applied to uh, ML. So it's like ML ops now. And um, we, we see that in more details because Sage Makeup Pipeline is very important. But uh, thanks to Sage Makeup Pipeline, uh, data science and uh, ML ops teams uh, can collaborate uh, using familiar tools and process for the well known continuous integration and continuous delivery, uh -huh, the okay. CICD. Okay. And we will see that again, but uh, SageMaker Pipelines is made of uh, three main components. Uh -huh. um, the first one, uh, pipelines, <laughs> which <Okay. laughs> include uh, any operation available uh, in Amazon SageMaker, such as uh, data preparation, uh, model training, model deployment to a real-time endpoint, or uh, batch transform. Okay. The uh, second component is the uh, model registry, uh, mm -hmm. which lets you track uh, and catalog uh, your model. Mm -hmm. And after the last um, part, the last component of um, SageMaker Pipeline is uh, MLOps templates, uh, okay. which includes a collection of built-in uh, CI/CD templates. Uh, published via, uh, via uh, AWS Service Catalog uh, for uh, popular pipelines, like okay. uh, build, train, deploy, deploy only, and so on. Okay, so this is a super, super important oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, feature. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to try and, and explain it to you uh, in, in, uh, yeah, in a few minutes. We're going to spend a little more time on this one because it's so important. Because I like it. Yeah, right? so That's a good I... reason, and it's important. I, I know it's, it's a major uh, headache for everybody out there. So. Uh, let's uh, take a look at my screen, and um, and we're going to see how we can uh, use the templates mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to quickly build uh, a, a um, quickly uh, provision a, a build, train, deploy pipeline. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we'll look at uh, the actual code that the data scientist would write mm -hmm. to uh, to automate. Mm -hmm. uh, the steps that you mentioned, uh, you know, data prep, train, uh, model evaluation, etc. Okay, and then uh, we'll we'll simulate a deployment to production. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say you know you're you're the data scientist, right? So you you you're working in studio. You have your workflow. Uh, you train your model, you test it, etc., and then you want to deploy. Mm -mm. Okay, but I'm the production guy, and <laughs> I want to make sure it works. Okay, <laughs> so I can knock at your door. So there's a quality gate, uh, and you you don't have permission to deploy. Oh, no. uh, so you just train your model, and then you know I'm gonna check it and make sure that all the boxes have been ticked, and only <laughs> then will I say yes, this can uh, this can go on, right? <laughs> Thank okay, you. <laughs> so here we see. Uh, again, you can see this uh, in uh, in uh, in this part of Studio. It's under Projects, mm -hmm. uh, and if you click on Create Project, you can see uh, the, the existing template, the built-in templates mm -hmm. uh, that we that we provide. But your organization could add uh, a different templates or different configurations, and you could use those. Okay, so I selected uh, Build, Train, and Deploy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I selected this template and uh, and it has actually sample code associated to it. Okay, and uh, we can I can show you uh, I can show you this uh, yes this code. Let me hide this. Or I should show you this instead. Yes. Okay. So the once the project has been created, okay. So we have sample repositories. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have two. Uh, we have one which would be, I would say, the data scientist repo mm -hmm. with your code, okay? Uh, and uh, this is this one here. Okay, so there's uh, some uh, scaffolding code, and this is the actual code that you would write, mm -hmm. okay? And I think I have it here already. Yes. So this is the code you would write, mm -hmm. right? So in this case, it's training a simple XJ boost model on the uh, Avalon data set, okay? And so we see the different steps, okay? 
So there's a, a processing step. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm guessing, you know, there's feature engineering mm -hmm. on this data set. So we create using this uh, um, pipelines SDK, mm -hmm. we create a processing step, right? Which is based on SageMaker processing. And then, uh, then we train the model. Mm -hmm. Okay. We can figure the estimator mm -hmm. with XJ boost. We set high parameters. parameters and we plug all that stuff into the training step. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, with the location of the training data set, validation data set. And then we have an evaluation step. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, to evaluate model accuracy, which is something you know, very typical. Um, and then you just uh, register the model. Right. Oh, mm -hmm. there's a conditional step. Sorry, I went a little bit too fast. So there's a conditional step to say if the accuracy of the model is higher than mm -hmm. whatever value, it's a good model. Mm -hmm. So I want to I want to register register it. I want to make it uh, I want to make it um, uh, eligible for deployment. Mm -hmm. OK, so we see the conditional step and the registration step. And then we build a pipeline. Right. So and we have all those steps in order. OK, so processing training, evaluation, and then the conditional step, which either registers the model or doesn't, mm -hmm. right? And so this is the code you would write. So you can see it's super simple. And logical. Right? It's logical. It's, mm -hmm. it's how you work, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, you use this uh, you use this SDK uh, for for pipelines, right? With, uh, you know, you can see here, say drinker workflow star, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And you write that stuff, mm -hmm. okay? And then there's again there's there's a, a boilerplate code that just runs uh, everything here, okay. And so um, this is all plugged into uh, uh, our uh, developer services, okay. And this is all part of the template. So mm -hmm. you know, as a data scientist, you wouldn't have to set this up, right? Your ops team would set that up. And so we can see uh, all this is actually uh, is actually plugged. This repository with your code and your pipe, your uh, uh, workflow, right? Um, this is actually configured as uh, the source step for a code pipeline, mm -hmm. pipeline, right? So every time you commit to your repository, right, uh, it's going to trigger this, okay? And uh, it's going to build your uh, your build your model, mm -hmm. okay? But it's not going to deploy it, okay? No, no, because you can't, <laughs> right? You don't have permission. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm, yeah, I decided you couldn't do it. Okay, so in your project, so you have those repositories, right? And uh, and you have your models. So every time you commit to your repo, mm -hmm. um, it's going to trigger that code pipeline that, that you saw, okay? And you need to be very clear on the difference between that Python mm -hmm. workflow that you define, right? Mm -hmm. That is uh, basically uh, triggering the actual code pipeline where we run your workflow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so once your uh, uh, once your model has been trained, uh, it's uh, it's uh, registered in this mm -hmm. case because it was a good model, but it stays in this state called pending, and it's actually something we set up in the in the Python workflow, um, we set the model state to pending because you could say, uh, or I could say, oh, okay, um, you know, I want to check that this model is a good model. So I could actually, you know, I could grab the model, I could run my own testing, uh, uh, and then you know, see what's going on here, and and you know, I could inspect this in, in detail, and I could say, okay, it's it's a good model. So if it's a good model, then I'm gonna you know, update it and say. It's approved, or maybe it's rejected, right? No, so, approved. Good model. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and update the status. Okay, and this triggers the other side of the of the story, which is that that other repository that uh, that we saw. Let me go back to the the other repo. Oops. Okay, which is the other repository where, let me show you this. We have a cloud formation template. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so, and this is, this is exactly what you think it is. If you've, uh, 
if you've seen cloud formation before. Mm -hmm. So it's a cloud formation template that will take the model that was approved mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and deploy it for real on, on an endpoint. Okay. Um, and again, this this is a, a built-in template, and you can write your own, right? So if I look at uh, my pipeline now, it's probably yeah. See, so the build the build pipeline. So let, let's call it the data science pipeline. Run before like three hours ago, and the fact that I just approved the model just now uh, says okay, now I'm deploying. Okay, and I see uh, that yeah. So I am actually deploying this. Uh, this is yeah this page is pending here so i can see i'm actually deploying it. and i could say you know so maybe i actually let you deploy mm -hmm. i let you approve your model mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. maybe you can say that you can say you can run your own test and say oh okay i approve the model it's good to go and uh, and then it could trigger the rest of the pipeline but see because i'm a very suspicious person no. there's a manual <laughs> approval stage right and and you could say okay I'm I'm gonna really really look at this now. It's like all right this is a really good model. Thank you again. <laughs> good for prod, right? You got like your N and out. It's perfect. <laughs> okay and and this will uh, trigger the actual deployment. Okay so. In this case, you know, it, it's you, you can figure out, you know, any team, every team can figure out what works for them. I mean, do, do you want to, how far do you want to let your ML team deploy? Uh, can they actually deploy in uh, in 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 an AWS account or or maybe it's a staging account? And it's okay. You can let them deploy and approve, auto approve their models in the studio. But then when you get to uh, prod deployment which probably means deploying to another AWS account, mm -hmm. uh, then you need to go to this quality gate and manual approval. So I really like pipelines because yeah. it, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it works for data scientists. You, 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 you can actually go and deploy your, uh, your models on your own in, in a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. And then you can say, okay, this is really good. Now I want to, I want to actually deploy it for real. But you can still have a quality gate mm -hmm. in, in cloud formation, right? And so, you know, the data scientists can work in Jupyter and Studio with the tools that they know, and the ops team or the QA team they can work with, you know, cloud formation and code pipeline, which mm -hmm. are probably the tools they know. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so the two can collaborate right, right, right. And, and do and do a good job. And you can see now we're deploying. Okay, again, these are built-in templates; they're very simple, mm -hmm. uh, but you can have uh, you know more elaborate ones where you deploy, you know, cross account, and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, uh, so this is a uh, pipeline, and again, we'll, we'll come back to this yeah. in, in great detail and we'll try to run all of this uh, again and again. It's super cool. It's really yeah, cool. it's very nice. Uh, but for some customers, you know, it's it's not what they want. No. Because some customers, <laughs> they want to deploy a BI. Ah, yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, for example, you know, lots of computer vision applications mm -hmm. are deployed at the edge. So a few years ago, we launched uh, a, a service uh, with a model deployment capabilities at the edge called mm -hmm. AWS IoT Greengrass, and, um, and which was a, a huge step forward. And we also launched uh, a capability in SageMaker called SageMaker Neo, mm -hmm. uh, which would uh, make it quite easy to compile mm -hmm. models exactly. for uh, particular hardware architectures for you know performance improvements. Um, so that's the state of the uh, edge. Uh, uh, on NWS, uh, anything new at reInvent this year? Uh, guess what? Yes. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Why am I asking? <laughs> it's Friday. So no, um, actually, uh, the StageMaker uh, Edge Manager was launched uh, during the last reInvent. And uh, let's tell me a little bit about uh, StageMaker Edge Manager. So, um, starting from a model that you train or imported in uh, Amazon SageMaker, uh, SageMaker Edge Manager uh, first uh, optimize it for your uh, Azure platform uh, using uh, SageMaker Neo uh, in order to uh, convert it uh, to an efficient format, mm -hmm. uh, which can be uh, executed on the uh, device by the uh, low footprint uh, runtime. Okay. And um, then uh, SageMaker uh, Edge Manager uh, package uh, the model and store it in uh, S3, uh, where it can be deployed to your device. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, 
Um, you can deploy uh, multiple models uh, okay. on your edge device, and uh, they are managed uh, by uh, an agent uh, which communicates with uh, the uh, AWS cloud for uh, model deployment okay. and uh, with your application for uh, model management. Mm -hmm. right. You can integrate this agent with uh, your application so that it may uh, automatically load and load uh, models mm. uh, according to your uh, prediction request. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. And this uh, enables a variety of scenarios, uh -huh. um, such as uh, freeing all resources uh, for a large uh, model whenever needed, or uh, working with a collection of uh, smaller models uh, that uh, cohabit in uh, memory. Yeah, that's pretty nice because <laughs> sometimes, you know, you want different models to do different things, right? So yeah. if you have computer vision, you could be looking, you know, for different types of, of objects. And, and obviously, if you have, you know, very specialized models, it usually works better than one very general model. So mm -hmm. you can load another model. Them. And I, I like the fact that you can do this automatically, right? So you, based on the prediction request that you receive, the agent will load and unload the model. Looks like it would be super, super painful to do this ourselves. <laughs> Yes. So, um, unfortunately, we can't really give a, an interesting demo in just a few minutes. Uh, so we'll try and come back to this later in the season. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're almost out of time. So we have a few more minutes for questions. So please uh, make sure you ask all your questions. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's time to wrap up. Hi, yes. So um, what did we talk about today? <laughs> you have 30 seconds. I'm going to do reduce it to this. <laughs> no, we're not going to do reduce it. <laughs> now, what, 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 what you did during this uh, first episode of the third season of the Stage Maker Friday, um, we did uh, and we introduced uh, the nine new uh, Stage Maker capabilities launched at uh, AWS reInvent uh, in 2020. Can I do it? Okay, let's do it. Yeah, I'll do them. I'll do them. Ah, go so, ahead. <laughs> data prep. So, data wrangler for data prep, clarify for bias detection, feature store for online and offline storage mm -hmm. of your features. Uh, then uh, model building, uh, another option with a jump start, yes. uh, you know, one click solutions, one click uh, models, mm -hmm. and uh, and then copy paste the code. <laughs> Lazy. Love that. <laughs> uh, training, so data parallelism to scale to super large, data sets with very high training efficiency, model parallelism to automatically split those crazy large models mm -hmm. across your cluster, no code change, well done. <laughs> um, the profiling capability in SageMaker Debugger, so figure out how efficient mm -hmm. your training job is and understand what potential problems are in there and how to fix them. And visualize. Visualize, mm -hmm. no code change. <laughs> uh, SageMaker pipelines, end-to-end, um, deployment and uh, and now you know data scientists and ML ops will happily work together. Oh, yes, yes, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> really? harmony at last. Uh, and edge manager uh, on the on a, for a model uh, multiple model management uh, on the, on the edge devices. So there are tons of resources, uh, and uh, we're not going to list them uh, uh, right now because, again, we'll come back to particular things you should read and, and watch in future episodes. But until uh, the next episode, you can go back to the SageMaker Fridays page uh, to watch the season one and season two episodes. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have obviously uh, have a lot of uh, launch blog posts. So if uh, you go to the AWS News blog, and look for SageMaker blogs, uh, you'll find everything we discussed today. And uh, and again, we'll come back to particular uh, things you should be uh, uh, reading in the next uh, in the next weeks. OK, so um, by the way, next week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, next week, mm -hmm. not two weeks from now. No, okay? next, next week, week uh, we're going to dive into data analysis mm -hmm. and preparation. Mm -hmm. And we'll use uh, Data Wrangler and, okay, and SageMaker Clarify. Right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and we'll spend uh, quite a bit of time on both. And uh, again, we just gave you a taste today, but we're going to go heavy into those two things uh, next week. Okay. So I hope uh, hope to see you all there. Uh, Sego, thank you very much for your insights. Uh, it was a pleasure to uh, to start this new season again. Okay. 
Uh, and thank you everybody for watching this. Uh, thanks to uh, all our colleagues involved in, uh, in setting this up. We really appreciate it. It was an absolute pleasure to uh, spend those 90 minutes with yeah, you. Uh, hope, yeah, we're exhausted. I hope you're not. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's time for the weekend, right? Uh, so have a great weekend, everybody. Uh, we'll see you next week. And until then, keep rocking with machine learning. Bye-bye. <laughs>